Hello, friends. We want to thank you for joining us today for another Crossing Paths amazing show. Uh, we have a wonderful young man here tonight, and we're just so pleased that you're tuning in and listening to what he has to say. What do you think, Don? Well, well it's just like you say, see that globe? Yes. It's spinning around the world, right? Right. Mm. God has sent us people from all over the yeah. globe, all over the world, you know. Right. We have uh, seven churches we built in India. Mm -hmm. We have a pastor there, uh, the Pastor Dr. Luke, and I'm, in, I'm not talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but <laughs> Dr. Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke that gave up his medical profession to run our churches. So that's what Crossing Paths, that's what your money is right. doing. You're doing these TV shows. We have people that helped us out about our backgrounds and everything else. And it's just the ones that support $7 a month or $77 a year, which we said before, we need partners. And that's the end of my asking for money because God has somehow always provided for this ministry. It's been on now for many, many years. And today we have this gentleman that I read his testimony, he sent it to me, and he was he just reminds me when I first got saved, my man are gonna have a hard time holding this man down. And that's what I wanna see in the whole body of Christ. Now, Ron, you're the former pro football player, right? Amen. You always was able to uh, maintain your height and weight and everything else, but you two guys both look like yeah, we're like players. the bookends today, huh? <laughs> bookends, <laughs> bookends, right. there today. I said, oh, boy, God bless I'm you. glad you guys are on oh. my side. <laughs> that's funny because that's just what I was thinking. I said, I feel like I'm a center over here sitting with a guard beside me. <laughs> so who do we have today? Hey, let, let me take this opportunity to introduce a friend of mine. I've known Bob for years. And, you know, a lot of people, Don, think that Christians are sissies. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. you're going to hear a, a, a story today, a, a real-life testimony of somebody that's really tough, that's been through a lot of hell on this earth. You're gonna hear a true story on God's true grace, and you're gonna hear it from a man of God. So I wanna to introduce today a friend of mine, Bob Chelinski. Thank you. Sure, Bob. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Hello, how you doing out there? Uh, first time on TV without being arrested. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat, you, like I said, I'll start uh, uh, my testimony. Um, first off, uh, I, uh, I love the Lord. Um, I love serving the Lord. And uh, He's made such an impact in my life where um, I'm lucky to be here. I'm alive through Him. Um, my life uh, was pretty crazy. I, I mean, I was born um, in Northview Heights in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a project on the north side in 1965. Um, I lived there for about five years. My father died in 1969. I never knew him. How old were you then? I, I was about I think five. Wow. Yeah, I'm not good at math, so you're going to help me out on that one. But uh, I, I, was, uh, I was five. I remember being five years old. I never knew my father. I don't have no memories of him whatsoever. Um, we were uh, lived there for, uh, well, for the first five years of my life. And I remember during the race riots in the late 60s, we were actually thrown out of there. Um, my family was split up for about uh, six months through the rest of my family throughout Pittsburgh. Um, I just remember moving around a lot. And um, uh, my mother um, was raising seven kids. I was the youngest of seven. Um, and uh, she was trying to raise seven kids on her own. And she was having just a, a, a really rough time. Wow. Um, and finally, uh, she had got us a house in Wilkinsburg. We all got back together, and that's where we ended up. Uh, I, I, I owe a lot of my life to my mother, not just for giving me life alone, but just because her relationship with Jesus Christ was... Uh, was just remarkable. Um, she had a very good relationship with him, and that's where I got mine from. But um, as as we went on, as I grew up, we moved out to North Huntington in 1972, out in the country. So I was used to living in a city as a little kid, and all of a sudden I'm out here in the country, and I'm always like, "What's that smell?" And I, <laughs> you know, here it's a cow, and you know, I mean, you see, it was just wide open. I mean, you could hear crickets at night instead of horns. Yeah, from what vehicles. am I doing here? Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, and we were just uh, most of the kids out there were run from the city, and um, we just grew up uh, just wild. I mean, we we had outside was our biggest playground. The sun came up, we were gone. Sun come down, we or when we were hungry, we came back home. Oh. Out the door, we went again. Um, I never had a stable environment when I was a kid. I never knew a father. I never had a role model. Um, my brothers uh, tried to be the, uh, the role model in, in my family, and um, it really wasn't a good role model on their own because we were about as dysfunctional as you can get. All right? And uh, 
uh, and from there, um, I was, uh, as, a, as a young kid, um, I was abused a lot, um, uh, and physically, emotionally, and uh, as time went on, um, I held that all in. I bottled up inside me, and that had a big impact on my life later on in my life. Um, so as I grew up out there, um, I was about the age of 11 or 12 years old. Um, I started dabbling in, uh, like, we were smoking cigarettes and uh, chewing snuff, and I started drinking about the age of 12. 12. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we were drinking beer, and, and then later on, we was, like, you know, going a little harder stuff. Um, we started dabbling in drugs. I mean, some speeders and... Uh, just stuff like that, and then as my teenage years went, I got more and more involved in it, and I, and I noticed that I got more and more violent. Was that in high school or grade uh, school? Junior high, junior, junior high. high. You were getting drugs at that age? Oh, I was doing, I think my, my first joint, I was in sixth grade, wow. I smoked. And, um, and as time went on, I mean, drugs had a big impact in my life, and, and uh, it was my escape for a lot of things. As you know, I'll tell a little bit later. Um, but as time went on, it was uh, junior high. Um, like I said, I didn't have a role model. I didn't have nobody to, to look up to. And uh, so I didn't know good from bad. I just yeah. did what I wanted to do. I didn't know about love. Yeah. Where did I learn it from? Work out. My mom, she was there as much as she possibly could, but she wow. was working, supporting You weren't going to any church? Or well, she would take me to church to church, and i just think, oh, i got to go to church. Yeah. All right, Mom, I'll go. I don't have a choice. I was a little kid. And uh, so she took me to churches all over Pittsburgh, and, and, you know, I didn't really grasp what was, you know, going on at church. So I, about the age of 16, I dropped out of school because I was fighting. I was really violent. I was cutting fights with teachers, with kids. And... Uh, but always on Sunday, my mom had TV evangelists on, Jimmy Swaggart and all them guys. And uh, so watching them, and then one day uh, my mom come up, we prayed, and I received Christ in my heart. At 16, I did not know who I received. I did not know nothing about it. Two weeks later, I watched a pack uh, of Pagan Motorcycle Club riding down the street, and I was infatuated with him. And I said, I want to be one of those guys. Hmm. 16. Wow. So uh, as time went on, I was dating a girl at that time when I was a teenager. I uh, dated her for three years. Um, she got pregnant. We got each other pregnant, we, you could say. Uh, and uh, at, she was nine months, week overdue, and she got a car accident. She was thrown from the car, and the baby was killed. Mm -hmm. But she survived. Um, I helped her back to, nurse her back to health, you know, for two months. Then I caught her sleeping with my best friend at the time. Um, I pulled a knife on him. He pulled his knife. We tried to cut each other. Nothing happened. We got in a fist fight, and that was it. Violence reigned in my life. Drugs was my escape. This is going on. So I had nowhere to go. Nothing. My life was a mess. I was 18 years old. Um, I moved to California. Drug scene out there was unbelievable. Uh -huh. Come back. I joined the Army at the age of 21. I was 20 and I joined, but I was 21 when I, when I finally went to boot camp. And I was, I was drinking, drugs was a big part of my life. And then once I went to boot camp, I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and I learned how to be, you know, I was in the infantry. So they actually showed you how to kill with your hands. Huh. And, and with weapons and everything, I was shown violence. I was, had a controlled violence now. And it's so hard to understand. I mean, but it was uncontrollable before. So at, when I got back, I got my first motorcycle, and I started hanging around the pagans in a bar. And uh, for four years, I was hanging around them and was constantly involved with them, and I was being taught the ways, okay? Uh, at the end of that four years, I think I was 26 years old, I finally became a member of that club. Um, that club was a very violent motorcycle club, uh, very dangerous, uh, and I felt right in with it. I, I just, it was like, this is me. This is where I belong. Yeah, you can relate to them now. You found, some, found somebody now that you can relate to. It was a sort of a family yeah. oriented, but it really wasn't. It was, that was more dysfunctional than the dysfunctional family I came from. Family, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm beyond anything, and here I am involved with it. And uh, drugs was a real big part of, of me in that situation. I mean, no one forced them on me. I did them because the availability of them was, was even more now. And, um, I was more violent, but they took my violence and they honed that to an edge and they used me. Hmm. And, and, you, and you wonder, well, where's God in all this right now? I mean, where's God in your relationship? God never forgot that prayer I said when That's I was right. 16. That's mm -hmm. right. I did. He did. Mm -hmm. He had his hand on me the whole time. Amen. Okay. That, but I didn't know that. I was running from him. 
I kept running from him. I kept rebelling against God. So you knew you were doing wrong, but you were still but, right. But it felt good. Yes, it, that's okay? right. And that's what was terrible about it. I didn't, see, I didn't know none of this stuff because I was blinded by, by the darkness in this world. And, and what I was doing, I didn't know what I was doing until I looked back and said, wow, look at that. Look what I did. Look what I did to God. How could he stay with me? How could he love a guy like mm. me? What I was doing in that club, I was an enforcer. I did a lot of violence. I hurt a lot of people. I put a lot of people in the hospital. All right? I'm, I'm, I'm not proud of this part I'm telling you, but I'm not proud of it at all. But it has a bearing on my relationship with Christ because he was there, but he, this happened. And it, it, it was just an awful time. I, I used whatever wasn't nailed down, you were getting hit with it. I always told someone, I was fighting in bars, so I said, I'll hit you with a bar so I'll hit you with an ashtray. If it ain't nailed down, you're getting hit with it. I'll hit you with a small person. Mm -hmm. I don't care, you're getting hit with it. And uh, it's going on for about five or six years, and I quit. I walked away. Just like that? Just like that. And you can't do that in that club. No way. But I did. Who does that? God. God's involved. Why, did you get like sick and tired of being sick and tired? Absolutely, I, always say, Absolutely. Right? I, I didn't have a life, I couldn't get a job. I was running 24 seven with them. I was always involved in violence. When, it, when, when the word stopped, they sent me. Um, I took care of a lot of a dirty business that, I, I mean, I had no heart. Were you selling drugs or anything like yeah, that? Yeah, of course I was. You weren't in prison at all in this time? Not at this time, no. I was selling drugs to support myself. Okay. If they knew what I was doing, I would have been booted out a long time ago. But I, the thing about them was, is that, <laughs> I, I don't want to talk too much about them because that, that world it's was a, a very different happy, world, yeah. Yeah, it's a different world. But I'm going I'm to emphasize on me because this is what it comes down to. Them guys did what they had to do to survive and to make a living. Okay? And I did the same thing. But my problem was I was doing more of it than I was selling. So I had a very, very bad addiction to drugs. I left that club in uh, 96, after I got in in 1990 or 90, 91, I think it was. I left in 96, was out, was living with a girl for three years. Broke up with her, and, and this is, I mean, this, sin was a part of my life. Mm. I mean, it, it, was, it coincided together. At the end of that three years, I went, they wanted me back. They asked me to come back. I said, yeah, I'll come back. But I said, on my terms. I wanted to keep a job. I wanted, you know, and, and you know, I mean, I didn't want that, what I had before. And they said, sure. <laughs> so I went right back to the violence. But it never left me. I had, was violent when I was living with that girl. I was out in bars beating people up. I mean, I was always fighting. I, I, mm. It was like I never went out without realizing there's going to be a fight and I'm going to be involved in it. And, uh, you know, but uh, where did I run from that? Right to drugs. Drugs was my escape, drugs was my crutch, okay? That's where I ran to. Um, I hurt a lot of people, and I went back to that same violence again, and I felt, I felt at home. At this time, that's when um, um, I, was, I was popped in and out of church. And uh, I met Pastor Frank Rocco, which we, we know, and Pastor Frank uh, was just a real, man, he was, he, he's just a powerful man of God. Yes. And, uh, so I knew him before I got back in, when I was in the club the first time, and then I got out and, and I was seeing him, then, then he didn't see me for a while. And then he was delivering fuel oil, because he had his job, and he come to their, their clubhouse. And I opened the door up with my full regalia on, my, my patches, you know, my, you know, and he goes, what are you doing, Bob? Like that. And I said, Pastor Frank, this is where I belong. And he goes, no, it's not, All right? But he couldn't tell me that at the time. I got back in that club in 1999, at the end of 99. In 2001, I went to Long Island, New York with about 100 other guys from all over the country, and we got in a fight with the Hells Angels. Uh, it was a turf war. Um, I was the first one on the grind. It was like one of the ones that went inside the building. There was only 20 of us, 25 of us that went in, uh, and uh, uh, one of the guys that was killed, I knew him very well, um, and I just seen just, it was, absolute chaos. We got outside, um, there was guys shot, stabbed, um, and I got arrested that day and was handcuffed for 24 hours. I never forgot, my hands were blue. Um, all of us were blue, we all had, it was a bad time, and then uh, we, we went right to prison. For how long? Uh, I, for two years, for two years. I, w I, would, uh, I was in Nassau County prison for 10 months, all of us, before we knew what was going on. We thought 
we were going back home, but we didn't. We ended up staying there. It, it's just, just imagine leaving your home right now and not coming back. And everything you have was just hmm. stays right where it is. And that's what it was like for a lot of guys and, and myself. And we, you know, and the, the case was complex. And uh, the federal government had a, had a case. And so we, uh, we ended up there 10 months in uh, Long Island uh, County Jail, Nassau County Jail. Um, I was fighting in there. I was fighting in prison, you know, and and uh, I was uh, I got a fight with a guy in there, and I hurt him pretty bad. Um, and we got uh, we finally got our, uh, the judge says complex case, no one's getting. Uh, my bond was seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay, my attorney told me he says, hey Bob, he says you put a house or two up, you'll you'll get your. I says maybe where you come from in Brooklyn, where I live, you got to put my neighborhood up. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you know seven hundred fifty thousand. I says I got. I came up here for a fight. I didn't come up here, you know. But the government looked at it as um, it, it was racketeering. It was organized crime. Well, well, you're supporting yourself on the money. You'd have money to continue on living, going and doing what you want, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was money, working. right? I was working now. Yeah, Harsh work- money, right from the criminals, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I did before, when I was the first time I was in, I did what I could to make money. Now I was working actually in a legitimate job. Oh yeah. And we we spend our own money to get there. Yeah. You know what I mean? But we all we all came up there. A lot of guys had their jobs. A lot of guys did what they did to make a living. I seen grown men. Prison. Uh, one fella asked me to describe prison to him, and I, I said, "You want to know what prison's like?" I says, go move into a house that's real small with about a bunch of people that you don't like, you can't stand, and you you just want to get out of there, but you can't leave. And when you're bad, go spend a year in a bathroom. Wow. Prison was something like that because that's the way it was. The bathroom was was the hole, and the guys you were around, you didn't want to be around. Where's God in all this? Yeah. <laughs> He's coming in. He was always there in the back one. I didn't know it. Hey, man, that's the good okay. question. Where um, was God? God, God uh, let, let me kill or be killed. He, always, he never took his hand off me. After I got out of prison, I developed a very serious drug habit. I was on crack um, and for four years. And after that crack addiction, I just cried out to the Lord. I mean, I'm leaving so much out because we, we don't have a lot of time, but I'd love to tell you more. But... Uh, I want to need. I need to express Jesus right now because this is the most important thing. Jesus, when I called out to him, he answered. And when did you do that? Now that was in 2011 that I called out to his name. Where at? In, in my bed. In your bed, all by yourself? All by myself. I just cried. Yeah, I cried. I said, Lord, please, please. Nobody help was me. witnessing no. to you or nothing. No. Just, uh, just. No. God's word will never return void. void right? From the time he was 16, it's phenomenal. Huh? From the time he was 16, he made yeah. a commitment. God's been so, faithful through all this. So you, I haven't. I wasn't right. faithful to him. Yeah. 34 that, years. Or you, you even had a spirit of just joy beating up people or stuff like that. You were in such a turmoil, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, well, yeah then where, where did I turn to? It was the drugs. Yeah, yeah. But didn't you, real quickly, you went to another prison too for after that. You got out of one prison, went to another. You were in a couple of prisons. Yeah, five different prisons in one year. Five different. Five different. I went from I went from uh, Nassau County Jail to Bro- FTC Federal Prison in Brooklyn, Federal Prison in Philly, Lewisburg Penitentiary, to finally up in a, in a jail. Well, but up nobody in liked you, evidently. Huh? Well, they didn't like all of us. <laughs> they, no one knew what to do with the prison. Yeah, yeah. No one liked me. <laughs> they didn't like me when I was hot. Okay, so now you come back and you find you're getting oh, you're getting dear. to the point where some people will say, and I think you and I can relate this. I got sick and tired of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Well, I put myself to rehabs. Okay. I went in and out of rehabs. I put myself in there because I, and I, I, God was not part of me. Drugs were. So I put myself in out of rehab. It did not work. I was back doing the same drug again, which was crack. It was a very, very, very addictive drug. I cried out to Christ and I said, please take this from me. I cannot do this no more. I, I need you in my life. And he answered me. What year was that? That was 2011. That was April of 2011. He totally delivered you from crack. I was delivered from crack. See, I was powerful. delivered from alcohol. I was delivered from uh, sexual addiction. I was delivered from all these things. Gone. Uh, Gone. Did Man. you go back to Rocco's church or what? Is yeah. No, I, no I, I was at a um, uh, World of Life church in Greensburg for a while. Then I went to Frank Rocco's place as my, my spiritual growth kept growing, and I had a calling to go there. Now, tell me what you're doing now. You have a ministry now. Um, I have a ministry through the church. Um, I go down the streets of Pittsburgh, and we feed the homeless uh, and minister to them. And, man, I tell you what, it's powerful. Talk about learning about God. When I go down there, I always have something to say, but it's always numb and void because the Holy Spirit takes Mm. over. 
All right, and, and, I, and the people with honors, it's wonderful. Hey, when's the last time you hugged a homeless person? Mm -hmm. When's the last time you gave them a hug? I tell people that, give a, uh, that their face lights up. Their mm -hmm. face lights up when you hug them, right? Amen. A dirty, filthy person, yeah. I mean, just, you know, they're like, how can you do that? Because I always said, Jesus, when I meet you, I said, I want to hug you hmm. and say thank you. So what did Jesus do? He says, when you do that to the least of these, Amen. you do it to me. So I'm hugging these guys Hallelujah. down there. Mm -hmm. So when I hug them, I'm hugging Jesus. Amen. Because when he says that, when you do the least, you're doing it to me. And so, man, talk about it. I didn't think about that until I thought about what I was going to do with him. And it just, like, just came. And I was like, wow, mm. check this out. I says, and, and so I hug these guys. I've never seen guys that light up. They have no love in their life. None. And they light up when you hug them. And how Amen. did you meet him? How, did we meet through Pastor Frank Yeah, Walker? through church. Through churches. Through church. Yeah. Yeah. But it's immense. His testimony is an amazing testimony. And once again, Dawn, for all the testimonies we hear, when you hear, okay, he made a commitment at 16 years of age, right? He went through all the hell he went through, but still God was faithful. Mm. I mean, God brought him back. Yeah. I mean, we can't come back on our own. Nope. I mean, God had to bring him back. And when he cried out, God was there for him. What a message for people to hear. Yeah, it's I mean, phenomenal. I, I got so in this. But just, I'm sitting here. This is funny. You remind me of... You were beating up people and everything else, you know. Yeah. Now, you're not beating up people with a, heading over the head. Not nah, just with the Bible and beating yeah, them up. No, well, <laughs> when we, had, we had Nick the Greek on here. Oh, he, he got saved in prison. Uh -huh. He took a Bible. He beat the guy in the head. Beat him, he with beat him on the head Bible. with the Bible. Yeah. And he said, that, he found out that's not the way to win people to the Lord. You know? yeah. This was Nick the Greek. We had him on TV. Uh -huh. Yeah, Nick the Greek. So yeah. now, you know, you're a strong man. People look at you. You're not a sissy, just like you said. You know, Amen, people think right. Christians are sissy. Well, I'll tell you what, Jesus wasn't a sissy. No, he wasn't. He went into the temple with all them religious people. I'll call them the Pharisees and Sadducees. Today it's a Democrat mm. and Republican party, okay? Sorry. But anyways, <laughs> and, and, oh boy. and he threw them out with he threw them out with a with a whipping chain or yeah. with a whip, right? right? Right, right. So yeah. now you have changed and you have the word compassion. And he gave me that. He gave me he gave me a new heart. He gave me a heart of love. And now I'm learning about love. He loved me. He loved me first. That's why I love him. Because he went on that cross, and, and, and I'm bought for a, pi a price, and that was the blood of Jesus Christ. And what? Right? He, he poured out his blood, not just for me, but for everybody. Amen. Man, and I did not know that and did not realize that until he came into my life mm. and, and, and just changed me. And now it's like I, I, couldn't, I couldn't hit nobody. I cannot touch somebody in violence today yeah, yeah. because it's gone. And what church are you going to now? I'm going to the church uh -huh, the in church. Soutersville. And the I tell church. the people, no, it's not Hootersville. It's not Petticoat Junction, but we do have a train running through town. Um, oh, <laughs> and uh, it's called the church. It's a non-denominational church. Uh, uh, Pastor Frank Rocco. And uh, it's so much of the word. Uh, it's Amen. just wonderful being there. Wow. And uh, I, I, yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story. When we were down on the streets, that uh, we went to a crack house after these guys, after the, after the loss. That's what we're supposed to do is, you know, seek the mm -hmm. loss and save them through Jesus. And uh, my one associate pastor was with me, and he, and he was he was banging on the door, and he says, it's Mike. And they're like, Mike who? <laughs> I'm like, you know, he goes, Mike, what And I, uh, I, I had a Bible in my hand, and I put it over my heart because I got shot. <laughs> he says, you got to shoot the word of God. But anyways, uh, I thank you so much for letting me be here. I mean, this is just a wonderful thing. Wow. And can I say one thing? Sure. Go ahead. The people out there, please forgive me that I hurt all the men and women that I hurt in my life. Mm. If, if you see this, please forgive me and that Jesus loves you like he loves me. Bob, I have a feeling here. Look in that camera yeah. and just say a sinner's prayer for somebody. That, we know there is no I such will. sinner's prayer, okay? Take a minute and do that, I would will. you please? Amen. Listen, if anybody's out there, you need the Lord. Uh, here's what you need to do. You know, just say, I'm sorry and forgive me. I sinned. I sinned and, and, and I, I come short of your glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. But you know, you're the only way to heaven right now that I know that. And I ask you right now, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life. Change my life. I invite you into my heart and live through me, Lord Jesus. I know that you died for me, and I know that God the Father raised you from the grave. You say them very simple words, mm -hmm. and you'll be saved. Because anybody that calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's all you need to do. Amen. He can save me. He can save you. Amen. Amen. Wow. You've been listening to a testimony here. And Bob, I'm sure will come to speak in any churches if you call, call our ministry here. And you know, we are 
trying to do the best to bring you to different people in right. areas across the country, whatever, Amen. of what Christ has done in their lives. Right. That's right. And oh. you know, it takes money. So if you can support us out there for $7 a month, $77 one check a year, or some, whatever you want to buy a whole program, but we need help. And that's my, I don't beg for money, I never have. We've been on the TV ministry now mm -hmm. for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. We never had to beg to spend two hours on money. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you something, we would appreciate your help. Now you've heard his testimony. We have people answering the phone. And them girls mm -hmm. are right there mm -hmm. waiting. Amen. Don't be bashful, get rid of that pride. You may be there, I'm talking about marriages and so forth. He said he got delivered from all them things, but he's still a Christian under construction. Yes. And so am I, and so are you. So we have a telephone number. Now the telephone number is 724-981-7777. God's mm. perfect number. <laughs> or 1-855-981-9777. Call that number, please. You know, this man is a perfect example mm. where the seed was planted, his mother was doing the best she could, mm. raising the family the best she could, and God says, my word will not return void. Amen. Call us right now. Somebody there, help you. God bless you and thank you for watching Crossing Paths. When you support Crossing Paths, you're helping to release the power of testimony. There's many people who know about God, but they don't know Him personally. They don't know His true nature and they don't know His heart. The stories that we bring you each week testify to the power of God and to the love of God. Through these testimonies, people all over the country are getting to know the Lord and developing a hunger to know Him more. When that relationship becomes alive, it's clear to see that no person or no situation is too far gone for the power of God. I like to share with people that it's very important to know who you are in Christ, because that day, if that was me laying there, I know that I would have missed uh, heaven. Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame Him, referring to the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. God is still the same. He's still this, God's word is still the same. They say times are changing. Times are changing, but God is still the same. <laughs> it's, it's a no brainer for me. You don't have to have a doctor degree to know oh. that God is good. He loves sinners. He just does not like the sin. When you partner with Crossing Paths and sow a seed into this ministry, you are helping us get the power of the testimony and the gospel over the airwaves. This will help people understand better who God is and connect them to the plans He has for them. Please call us today and support this vision.